this film is inspired by true events. Michael Lombardi, how the hell are you doing today, man? Good, Johnny. How are you, bud? I'm fantastic, man. I'm out in the Poconos right now um, in a hotel room, so it's a little different setup for those. Yeah, I don't have my bar behind me like I usually do or anything like that, but uh, man, I'm excited to have you here on the show, man. How's it going today? <laughs> Thanks so much. The Poconos. Uh, don't they have like, isn't that where they have like uh, champagne, uh, like glass bathtubs and stuff? Isn't that what the, <laughs> you know, you might know better than me. You're from, you're from New York, which is only about an hour and some change away. Um, and yeah, yeah. I didn't know about the Poconos until we started coming out here to mix our record. I mean, I, when I hear the name Poconos being some, from Southern California, I'm like, oh, it's got to be like this awesome beach vibe going on and everything. I get out here. And it's mountains, and we're staying at a Mount Airy Casino right now. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Again, it's in Pennsylvania, just outside of Jersey and, and New York. So yeah. everything's like right in this area. And I, and I understand you grew up uh, in New York City, right? Yeah, based, I grew up like an hour and 20 north in Connecticut, but I put a lot of time in, in New York, man. That's where I came up in Manhattan, you know through acting school and it all. I put a lot of years in there. So yeah, in the... Uh, where you are, I remember when I was a kid, there were these commercials, uh, beautiful Mount Airy Lodge. And it's like this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got to find those, dude. I got to find it. Old commercials. And that was like the spot. But then like other places, I think it got a little bit depressed for a while. And it wasn't like the, so So I, I, I'm sure it's beautiful and incredible. But I think back in the day, it was the spot over there. Man, it is, I, I'm glad you brought it up. I mean, it is beautiful. Don't get me wrong. It was just, it, it's, there's a nice golf course out here that I haven't had the time to go out on. I've been out here probably collectively over a month now at this time, but we keep going back and forth. At yeah. any rate, it's a beautiful place, a lot of fun, good casino, good gambling. Yeah. It's just uh, when I hear Poconos, it's not, I, I, I was, I don't know why I was expecting something different. Uh, I wasn't, I didn't grow, I didn't have the opportunity to grow up with that commercial that you were talking about, you know? Dude, you would have a whole new, you'd be looking at it through a different lens, bro, if you did. I, I mean, really, I really hope it's on YouTube somewhere because when we're done with this conversation, I got to find it and show it to the rest of the boys that, that are out here with me. Okay, great. Please do. It's got to <laughs> gotta live somewhere, man. <laughs> well, uh, obviously, uh, we're, we got, we're going to get into uh, that poster behind your, your, your head there, the Retaliators movie. But before we get into that... Um, I wanted to go to a little bit more of your backstory. Uh, as we said, you grew up in New York. We already touched upon that. But as I understand it, you were studying to be a, uh, or studying drums rather, um, and then got into uh, acting through there and then ha have a band, uh, the Apache Stone, that released yeah. their self-titled record in 2009. Um, yes. Tell me about your music, uh, your, your music background before we get into the acting. Geez, I mean, it's it's uh, it's tough to talk about with a guy like you. I, I'm like embarrassed, but uh, <laughs> oh no, man! It's funny that was the case because I obviously when we get to the Retaliators, all the incredible musicians I've been around and coming full circle, it's right. It's crazy, you know. Um, uh, so basically, m my mother grew up in New Haven, Connecticut, which is a very musical city. It's a great city, and her brothers were incredible musicians and. Her, uh, her, her brother, uh, Anthony, was an incredible guitar player. And then her other brother was an amazing drummer. So they had a band. And my, my grandmother, she recently passed away. She was 104 years old, by the way. So she was a single. Whoa. Right? She was a single mom. Congratulations to that, man. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. That, I, I don't mean to cut you off here, but that's no. an achievement. Well, you, can't just, you can't just gloss over Bro, wait till I tell you like how, what a miracle it is. I, 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 so, so she was a single mom, a waitress, right? And her, she, she did everything she could to get these instruments for her boys, you know? And uh, 
I, my mom remembers. So, so my uncle was so good at guitar. There was no one in New Haven that could like, he had like a hollow body jazz. He was like a jazzy guy. And he would take the train into Manhattan. Jim Hall was his teacher at the time. He shot like an album cover. He was a really handsome guy, like him on this stool. And what happened was he, it was just like in the 60s, he took a hit of acid and he never came back, man. He tripped out. And it affected. Oh, he permafried. Yeah, and he was such an open, wonderful, like young man. And that's a very between sixteen and eighteen years old. In there, it's such a precious time with your brain and uh, in development. And uh, so, what happened was he and, and she ended up. This is a part of the story going back to her when he was playing in these bands and really getting big and playing around manhattan she bought him a guitar that at the time was like a thousand dollars and for her as a waitress it was a really big deal right yeah um, yeah and he was he was like really doing it and i think he was around 18 or 19 when this happened but anyway to get circle back to her to living to 104 so this is my musical influence, by the way. So I remember, so what happened was he he lived home the rest of the time from like 19 on and lived with her. Uh, you know, my other, my, obviously my mom got out, her brother, brother got out and he smoked four packs of smokes a day, sometimes more. So he would walk around the house and just be like, and smoke and smoke and smoke. And she lived through this secondary, secondhand smoke. Yeah, secondhand smoke, yeah. 104, man. And I remember wow. coming over there, and there would be guitars everywhere. But, like, you know, some with just broken strings, just all the instruments would be around, and he'd, like, pace, and he was the nicest guy. He'd be like, Mike A, when I'd come over. But he still could pick up and play beautifully, but he wasn't the same. You know, he had voices and very sweet, sweet man mm. still. But anyway, so I – uh I got my first drum set when I was young um, from my other uncle and uh, I played a lot, you know, and um, I went into Manhattan. There was a place called the Drummers Collective. So when I was like 20 something, I was going in there, but now it's just called the Collective. They have like a bass school, a drum school. It's a full thing, but I was one of the first students there. And that's, that's where I was, you know, I got way into playing drums and, and uh, I started taking, I, I, I dove into a few acting classes during that time as well. Okay. So drums, so now, now that we got the drumming is your, is your first instrument, but then in Apache Stone, you're the lead singer, yeah. um, obviously. And this is obviously after you've started some of your acting career and studies and everything. So what made you, uh, I mean, did you play drums on this record too? W w tell me a little bit more about Apache Stone and how that, um, how that album came together. Yeah. So, um, I didn't play drums on it. I, 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 you know, got to a certain level on the drums and I just love, uh, I love rhythm. I love the instrument. I love hand drums. I love all kind of, all kinds of drums and drumming. It's just something I do for fun. And, uh, mm -hmm. I, I learned a ton at that school, but then, um, I started another band and I enjoyed writing a lot, writing music and the process. And, and uh, I just sort of worked on my voice myself and then later got, got a little more understanding. It's such an unbelievable instrument in itself, but um, I formed Apache Stone and it's very, very, very nineties grungy influenced. And I think that's even for the name in fact, and uh, my favorite bands were like Pearl Jam, Audio Slave, STP, Alice in Chains, uh, you know, um, Chili Peppers. Uh, Those are the ones that, man, in your voice, when I listened to Apache Stone, I was picking up Eddie Vedder and, um, and uh, what I want to say Flea, and obviously he's the bass player. Which is, why am I drawing a blank? Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the best dude ever, dude. I hate when that. Do you hate when that happens? When you have yeah, like a happens to me a lot, man, fart? man. I'm getting old. Um, <laughs> told, I'm with you. Yeah, but all those guys, man, that was it. And you know, I think at the time I Kiedis. I'm sorry, I knew it was going to come to me. Anthony Kiedis. Jesus oh, fucking Christ. Oh. I was picking up Eddie Vedder and Anthony Kiedis in your voice on the Apache Dude. Stone. That's what I was doing. And and I think a lot of it, you know it's hard because you can't. You can't run from your influences and we're all inspired and influenced and you try to make it your own. And I think with that band and with that, I was so, uh, 
I think now, obviously, I'm in a much different place that all those influences would play more into and I'd be able to bring my own uh, spirit to a more. Not that I didn't with that album. I wrote all those songs, but I was so heavily saturated and still sort of a young musician and not like as young obviously as you guys were when you did your thing and you are now and you had your voice but I think that was an interesting journey for me and 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 a learning one I hit some level of success with it because I was on a television show at the time called Rescue Me Rescue Me yeah about New York City firefighters post 9-11 and uh I had a hundred episode run on that show as a series regular and I played like the rookie firefighter who uh he's called the proby the probationary firefighter and 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 leary's like the salty dog in the house so it's like yeah dennis leary the comedian uh, and i loved him yeah i loved him in the 90s loved him in mixed nuts yeah i'm so glad you brought up rescue me naturally that way because it was one of the things obviously i wanted to talk to you about as well because before you were coming on the show uh i i i knew of rescue me i knew the show um, but I went through your IMDb and I was like, well, what else is he known for? You know, the, the typical, uh, background stuff you might do. Yeah. And I found rescue me. And I was like, I remember that show. I was a kid. Um, well, I wasn't a kid. I, I, I was younger and I remember hearing, I mean, this was one of FX's like first drama shows that just blew the fuck up. It was like, it was critically acclaimed. It was winning all the, uh, the TV ratings and everything like that. But for whatever reason, I didn't pick it up at that time. So when I knew you were coming on the show, long story long here, I started watching it. And I was like, okay, I got to give this show. I've heard so many great things about this. I know it's, it's, it's far removed from the time that it, like, it was water cooler talk, but I still got to get into it. Went on Hulu, found it on FX Hulu. And I'm only two episodes in, so I'm not going to lie, but I'm already, I'm already sucked in, man. I love Dennis Leary's <laughs> humor. I love the dramaticness of it. I love the... I mean, right off the bat, the, you, you mentioned being a rookie, and they, they're obviously coursing you into peeing in a cup and shitting in a bag and putting it on the Chiefs' on the Chiefs' desk. And I'm like, come on, what's not to love here in this show? I'm already, I'm, I'm hooked, dude. First of all, thank you. That's sick that you started watching it. The show is nuts. Leary's crazy. And that show, you could never. I don't think it could survive today. I mean, by the way, we went off. The no way. Right oh. off the bat, dude, the joke, the, 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 the banter and the dialogue right off the bat. I was like, oh, oh, that wouldn't fly these days. Oh, bro. The thing about it is, is it's a firehouse. It's a bunch of dudes ragging on each other. And, and what was fun for me is my, I'm the rookie, the pro, the pro B he's called. It, he catches a lot of shit and it's really funny, man. And Leary, like I said, is the salty dog and he's from Worcester, Mass, Dennis, like his, his, yeah. His dad was a mechanic. Like he, he holds the fire department so close to his heart. He, there was something called the Worcester Six, and it was before nine eleven. And uh, and uh, his cousin died in that fire. So he started the Leary Firefighter Foundation, and then obviously it started growing so big and there was an obvious need for it after 9-11 and he's raised millions of dollars, man, that goes straight to the cause. Like if guys in New Orleans need boats, rescue boats, if, you know, guys need ropes, uh, it supplies the firehouses, a new truck with unbelievable equipment to do their job right, you know? And uh, it's funny because he wanted in this film, in, in this show, he shopped it around to a lot of different networks. I remember at the time being close with him and sort of, it's amazing how much I ended up learning from him that I realize now because I'm producing this. He, yeah, the, the re- he, he, yeah. He produced Rescue Me, co-created, starred in it. So I was like, wow. So I was able to pick up a lot being around the guy, but finding the right home for it. And you're right, FX you know, like whether it was CBS or somewhere in, in, in that NBC, CBS, one of the major networks was like, yeah, we got it, but you have to shoot in LA. And he didn't want to shoot in LA. It's a show about New York City firefighters. Then someone else was like, yeah, he wanted to choose all the music. That's another thing that the music is, right. you see, um, the, the Von Bondies are the opening theme song. Of yeah, the, yeah. Was, yeah. That, I heard that. I was listening to it. I was like, that's that's an interesting pick, but I, I I like it. It sets it sets up a vibe, you know. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, he had all this creative control that he wanted because he wanted to make sure that he told his story and it was a truthful story and depicted firefighters as real human beings. So at the end of the day, they're guys who do their job and their job is to run run in 
burning buildings when people are running out and save people, but they are flawed human beings. You know, they're real people. Yeah. It was so important to him to get into that story and 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 express that uh, th- th- who they really were. One guy is a gambling problem. The chief, you'll see as you go along. This guy has this is PTSD. All these different issues that we all struggle with as human beings, but their job at the end of day at, at the end of the day is what it is, and they're heroes. And there was that aspect, and then in the fires, he wanted it to be really real, so it's not like. Like Backdraft's a cool movie, but it's like right. against flame and you can see everything in a real fire. You can see a foot in front of you if you're lucky, sometimes not even. So the audience might not be able to see our faces perfectly in those scenarios, but he wanted it to be real and filled with like, so you felt the the raw uh, uh, and, you, and, and, and you maybe uh, could just maybe smell the smoke from watching the screen. That was really important. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, but the show, man, it goes, it goes pretty, there's some dark levels to it. There's a lot of comedy too. It's both. And right. it, it, that was another thing they didn't know, like we'd get nominated for Golden Globe, but do you go comedy or drama? So I think that kept them out of things, but that was never his concern. It was always about the work and telling the real story, you know? Yeah. You don't worry about a genre when you're writing something. I mean, that goes for music, it goes for any art. I think you don't care about the genre. You just fucking go for it. Right. Yeah, man, you write your story and the story that you want to tell. And that's when I was saying uh, to bring this back to Apache Stone. That was my band at that time. That was my influence. That's what, but like in making this movie, I was all the things. And of course, I'm older now that I've been been influenced by. I never for a second tried to be any one thing in this, but who me and the writers to tell the story that we wanted to tell. And I think that's what I'm so proud of about this film. It may not be for everyone. And I know we're going to get to it later, but that's cool because nothing that I like or nothing that I think is good is for everyone, right? You don't try to create something that's for everyone. You create what you want to make and what you believe in and the story you want to tell. Um, so yeah, that was important. And Dennis is a very, uh, he, he, he taught me a lot about that and other things. Yeah, man. I mean, no, let's get into the movie. Now we could come back to the rescue me stuff. I wanted to touch upon it a little bit and talk to you a little bit more about Dennis and, uh, thank you for, I mean, you already gave me backstory on right there. I had no idea it was even kind of loosely based or very closely based to his real life being the uh, the writer and everything in that charity you just mentioned right there. Had no idea about any of that stuff. As I said, I'm just starting to rewatch it. So yeah, thank you for that. And we'll get back to that. Cause I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan already two episodes in. I'm going to finish this damn thing. So, uh, <laughs> but you know, the, so with the music, obviously doing yeah. the, doing the Apache stone. Um, and now, as you said, you learned a lot from Dennis on the, on the set, you know, being a producer, mm-hmm. writer, uh, lead, lead, uh, actor, and I'm sure some directing, as you mentioned too, in this, in this film, the retaliators, I just watched it last night. Uh, I got the screening. I'm really stoked. I was really, it was really fun for me. I had uh, a few friends in the movie that I've had here on the show, as well as just uh, touring with and stuff like that. So, I mean, right off the bat, I was like, ah, oh, this is awesome. This is really fun to see some of my friends in a, in a, in a feature film, you know? So it was really cool. Um, walk me through a little bit about, uh, I mean, you guys did a uh, how did Better Noise become a part of this, right? So, like, Better Noise is a record label, um, and uh, correct? And then just walk me through how the music was important to this movie and why you had all these all these guys like Eva from Eva Under Fire right off the front. You got Jacoby as, as one of the main killers. You got all the dudes in Five Figure Death Punch. My good friend Spencer Charnas from Ice Nine Kills. Doc Coyle's in there. I mean, you got all these guys that, that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really close with, and uh, it's, it's really cool to see. So walk me through that, that marriage of uh, a horror movie and these guys. Yeah, man, that's so cool. I love uh, one thing I want, as you said, all your friends, and I just love that all you guys are so close. You know, I, 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 this, this uh, artistic community, it's so special what you guys do and what you bring to people, but then how obviously it's a commonality that you all have, but how you're all close. It's it, so that, so that's amazing that, that you're friends with them all and you obviously picked up on it. Um, uh, you know, the th- let me tell you how it started. Um, right. Let's go. Tie in uh, Apache stone here. Interestingly enough, 
And then one thing that I wanted to tell you that I we left earlier, just to, uh, just with Rescue Me, my band was written into the TV show Rescue Me. You'll see it comes up. Lyric, oh, that's rad. He knew I had a band, so and it's ragged on because he's like, oh, geez, this because I'm the rookie. So, but it's my real life band, and he pulls from real life because that's what writing that you know you write what what you know, you know that's how you get the strong. So anyway, my band's written into the show, so I was able to you know sell a few albums. It's featured in there for three or four or five episodes, uh, not that's through. Two songs, not a few albums. I had one album. So anyway, and and a little record deal. So get this. Shortly dur during after that time, uh, maybe 2010, 11, 12, 11 ish in there, I was uh, living in LA, going back and forth a lot. I've mainly been East Coast, but I would be go back and mm -hmm. forth. And my music manager at the time was like, "Hey man, you know, we I was doing an uh, an EP or something." He's like, "You know, uh, and this is while I'm on Rescue Me, by the way." So he says, you know, um, I want you to write with these brothers. They're really talented guys. They work, they live in uh, Orange County. It's about an hour and a half out from L.A. Why don't you go write songs with them? And I was like, amazing. I would love to. So I drive from L.A. And Darren Gear was one of the guys I wrote with. Now, I should tell you now, guess who wrote The Retaliators? The Gear Brothers. And I'll bring that full circle <laughs> in a minute. All right. So, uh, so I would go and write with Darren and... Uh, and, and, and also this guy named Jeff Tucker, who was in a band, the lead singer of a band called uh, Rock Kills Kid. And uh, they were a big band. band yeah. yeah. And Darren at the time had a band called Hong Kong Six. And I mean, these guys were doing it. You know, they had before that. But so I felt like yeah. Darren and I were just so creatively aligned, like all of our influences musically, but also in film and art. And we just hit it off. It was like, the perfect just laugh finish each other sent sentences had so much fun writing these songs together so cut to now uh you know i'm acting i'm sort of all over the place on different sets and working and that's what my my life is but obviously music is something that influences me every day and in my scenes and characters i play and everything so about five years go by I haven't, I haven't spoken with Darren for a while and I was on a movie set and I got asked to do a charity event. So at this charity event, I was going to play one of the songs that Darren and I had written five years earlier. And it was called when heaven and hell collide. The song hasn't been released. None of the stuff we did, but uh, mm. I, it's some of my favorite stuff. Cause as I said, it evolved more like we were talking earlier and became more me and more Darren. And anyway, um, so I had to drop it half a step, the song for the, it was already in drop D and I'm like, this thing's going to sound muddy, but it wasn't my band. It was a house band. So I called Darren and I'm like, Hey man, listen, you know, heaven and hell, I got to drop it half step. What do you think? Should I switch to this other song we wrote? I'm trying to figure it out. I really want to do this one. What have you been up to? And he goes, Oh, my brother and I have been writing screenplays. And I was like, send them to me. So he sent me all the screenplays. The retaliators was one of the screenplays. About three days later, I was on a plane to L.A. and uh, told them I have to make this movie. When I read the script, I saw the wink at the 80s, you know, all, and 90s, the great movies. We talked about Lyric, Judgment Night. Remember the soundtrack on that? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 the Crow, Lost Boys. And I felt the wink at the 80s. And this is what I said to Darren, this Spielbergian sort of Dante gremlins -y, small town beginning into this slow burn, uh, uh, almost Sin City-esque sort of graphic novel -y, uh, aspects and, and uh, Death Wish. And oh, I love like spaghetti string westerns and Clint Eastwood. And I oh, yeah. really get a little ballsy like that and have that edge. And I was like, I love that. And then this crazy third act that was obviously could you could say is inspired like a Tarantino ish kind of crazy third act or Evil Dead. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, I tell you, say all this, to Darren. He's like, exactly, man. That's exactly right. Whereas Darren puts it like a thinking man's hostile, um, right? But what I loved about the script was that it's story driven. You know, it's a horror, but it's on the highbrow side of horror you know it's got like a lot of uh a lot of story and as an actor i was i saw the layers of the characters and the places the lead gets to go and i was like wow playing this guy would be amazing so this is crazy so i i do the charity event at the charity event is alan kovac alan kovac is the ceo and founder of better noise music 
He's a legendary music manager. Yeah. Had the Bee Gees in the day, Meatloaf. Now he's got Motley Crue, Five Finger Death Punch, Bad Wolves, Ice Nine Kills. You know, all the bands that are, we're yeah. talking about that are in the movie. And afterward, we all went to dinner and he's like, hey, you know, I'd like to do something with you. I'm like, oh, I'm an actor. I have the script. He goes, hey. so he had produced The Dirt, the movie, The Dirt, the documentary on, on Motley. Right. And yeah. uh, I brought him The Retaliators. So that's how you were asking earlier how the music became yeah. involved. How serendipitous that I hadn't talked to Darren in five years. I talked to him about this charity event I'm going to play one of our songs at. I play the song at the event. Alan Kovac is there. We that's meet amazing. and we make the movie. So when I gave him the script, the music jumps off the page to me. Like, even though it doesn't say, hey, this here, I just thought, what a perfect marriage for like hard rock, metal, horror this script there's so many different characters it's a fun popcorn movie and it's entertaining which is what it's meant to be but yet it's got some really cool characters so alan's mm -hmm. like let's go let's make this thing and he never looked back man he never wavered and i can tell you the uh, challenges of making a film it's so hard on so many levels to to get that story that you loved on the page onto the screen you know like whether it's egos location changes having to pivot covid in this case so hard but he had this vision and he said i want to put my musicians in it and then the next thing he does is he gives me like all his musicians numbers and he's like call them tell them about the movie we talked about the roles i called jacoby and i remember like He's like, yeah, tell me about it, man. And I tell him about the whole script. And I remember like specifically Jacoby's, his heels were sore that day because he jumped off the stage the night before. It's my first <laughs> conversation. And he was like, dude, the son, I told him the whole movie. And, uh, and I'm like, we want you to play Quinn Brady, the bad guy in the film, I think. And uh, he was like, dude, let me, let me sit with it a little bit. Uh, you know, if, if, if Alan thinks this is right, I'm in. And what Alan wanted to do was, have this was very important to us to have this beautiful uh relationship with this all these incredible musicians and this amazing soundtrack but the most important goal was to make it a movie first that was a true movie that is uh uh respected within the genre but then having this amazing gold lining of this these songs and this core audience of all these musicians so I, I have a lot more to say on that, but I haven't let you talk in a minute. So maybe I should uh, stop this. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no, man, this is, this is great. I love, I love getting into the weeds of all this. Like, this is exactly what I wanted to hear. Uh, it's so cool. I mean, w w you'd mentioned Motley Crue there too. And I didn't mention Tommy Lee, his amazing uh, cameo role as the uh, stripper DJ. I'm sure, I'm sure he had a lot of background um uh, for the inspiration on that uh love you tommy uh dude it was it was it's just fun to see those guys obviously i love that alan was uh so basically as you said there it was basically his idea to actually put his uh his uh bands in the movie not just on the soundtrack which was very which was a really interesting choice to me and then you one of the things i wanted to get back to when you were talking there was uh, you talked about how difficult it is to take a movie from a screenplay on paper and make it a realization for us all to watch and enjoy. Um, I know you've been on several movies like, uh, so this isn't your first time around the block. Um, you know, you were, you were on, a uh, in 2015, was it the last night? Yeah. Was with Clive Owen and Morgan Freeman. I'm sure that was a, a pretty high budget scene for uh, for putting together a movie. Uh, uh, you could walk me through that in a minute uh, or tie it in here because uh, walk me through a little bit more of the, let's get into the weeds on that. Uh, what it takes yeah. for you to take a, a screenplay, create a movie, and obviously the, the correlation between music and movie, something that I'm trying to learn because I've had some actors um, and, and different people in, in, the, in that side of, of entertainment on the show now, and I've befriended a few of them, and I, I, I know some friends who are becoming producers and all this stuff, and it's a very interesting world to me because just the name producer as a musician means something, but then as a, in the movie world, in, the, in, the, in, in that world, producer means something very different. So can you explain to me the difference of that job and how, 
how that's an integral part of making that screenplay become something we get to watch. Yeah, geez. Um, there, there, are all, there, there are several different kinds of producers on a set. There's your line producer who's going to do like budgets and pay the crew and locations and all that stuff. He's in the office. But then you have your you know, co-producer. It's like next step up, executive producers, producers. And they vary from television in terms of the creative power or influence you might have on a project. They vary from television to film. But basically, I was both on this, a creative pr producer. And what that means is, you know, I liked directing a little bit more and we'll talk about that. But I love producing because you're getting the vision and what the script is and you're you're making sure that everyone's aligned. You're blocking mm -hmm. the director to help him and you're sitting down and making sure that you guys and that you've hired the right director, you're, you're casting, you're hiring, you're, it's basically in this position, everything that Alan and I set out to do with this film, I, we were the guardians of the story, if you will, in this case. And okay. so that is, we have a locations scout, a locations manager you know, making sure that they have the proper images and the vision of what we want. Um, you know, if there has to be a rewrite to the script, communicating with the, with the, with the writers. Uh, it's literally, uh, on this one, I did everything. And the thing, I love the creative part of it, but there's a, you're on the phone a lot, a lot. Like, basically all day long, two phones going 14, 15 hours a day, and you're putting out a lot of fires all the time and with COVID. So what's nice is if you're on a big budget film, you're going to have four, five, six, seven producers, could have more, could have three, but it's it takes a lot because there we had a 50 person crew on this. So there's always going to be issues. There's going to be union things, as I said, with COVID and protocols and I had an amazing crew and a lot of people. It's a collaboration. Um, but the goal was, and this is important, and I'm sort of tying in what we said with these incredible musicians to make this a film first. So in this case, right from the start, calling all the musicians and carefully putting them in their right part. So if you weren't a fan of Papa Roach, you would just think, Jacoby Shaddix was an actor and then you might leave the film and go man that soundtrack wow that guy look him up and go wow he's the lead singer of Papa Roach five finger death punch they play the motorcycle gang we really wanted to make sure obviously these are big burly dudes right like mean looking guys all tatted up dreaded beards motorcycle gang so we really cast them in a way where they would shine as actors but also bring value to the film but the film bring value to them. So it's a symbiotic thing where now people in the horror genre or thriller genre go see the movie and they're exposed to this great music where maybe they weren't in the past. I just didn't want to like leech off these guys. It was really important. And the other thing, part of this, we'll go a step further, is I wanted it to be a good movie. And I think yeah. from an actor's standpoint, and even from my like agents at the time, Oh, you're in a movie with eight musicians with this soundtrack. Uh, it's probably not that musicians aren't good, but it's probably not going to have the same weight as just saying you're in this film, like you talked about last night with Clive Owen and Morgan Freeman, right? A Lionsgate movie. And I'm not saying that's what this is, but I thought it was really, like you mentioned, Eva Marie from Eva Under Fire. She opens the film. She's an amazing singer. The band's starting to blow up. They're incredible. And she's an actress in this movie. And I think it all started. I had conversations with each and every one of them before they got, to, uh, got on set and on set. They all brought it, man. They were so good because they're natural storytellers, right? You're a natural storyteller through your instrument, whether you write whether you're a lead singer, you're singing the story. And I think with on set and with acting, you know, you maybe have to pull it in a little bit, keep it more behind your eyes, but you know your intention and your character's intention or the objective. And what I saw that was so beautiful is every musician, they know hard work. I think they've all like Spencer, all these guys have put their time in, right? And they know mm -hmm. 
they took it very seriously. And I'd see them in the corner sort of doing emotional preparation, like getting themselves there. And then I don't know how deep their work was for their characters, but I know when they put their two feet on the ground and the camera was on them, they were honestly all great. And I love that maybe you might have to pull someone back a little bit, but that's beautiful rather than having someone who's afraid to go there, you know, and doesn't yeah. have that inside, even if it's not what the scene calls for. If you have something going on behind your eyes and you're connected uh, emotionally, which I think that you know, you guys can wear your heart on your sleeve. And if you don't even wear it on your sleeve, it's pretty accessible to you, these emotions. So they were, they were wonderful. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think it helps too. a lot of these guys that you luckily for whatever reason, Alan was already managing. Right. Um, yeah. But I've, I've seen all their music videos. Like they, they, they make great music videos and they're all acting in them. I mean, Spencer uh, is is great at that his imagery for the band ice nine kills alone i mean it, it is a horror movie that's what that's what the whole thing is you know and uh and he's great at it you know jacoby being on the hip to be uh, uh hip to be squared uh, it's not hip to be squared it's uh yeah you know the song you know the fucking song anyways yeah. he's uh, he's on it and you know and uh you know they do these really cool music videos so i think that's something that the they're not especially the guys that you that you chose but musicians who have been in music videos and stuff i can attest a little bit aren't we're not afraid of the camera at this point put it that way you know um yeah. Yeah. but the, i wanted to touch on something you you just said though when you're watching them prep for um for a scene for a shoot or whatever um you said you didn't know their how much backing they they did on it but i want to talk about your backing on it then so You've you've been a musician. You've been in a band that's had a record label, a uh, record deal, as we said with with Apache Stone. You've created music as well. You've created movies and you've done acting. Are there any similarities in studying these two different uh, genres of entertainment? You know, like I mean, you're studying drumming and studying how to you know your vocals and how to write in music. How do you? I've never studied the other side. You know what I mean. So like, how do you? What what goes into studying uh, acting as a as an art? So I think that they're incredibly similar. I think that uh, they move people both, right? Like yeah. you might listen to a song and cry, or think about a time, or forget a time, right, or an experience. And I think that's what going into movies does, or reading a script, or a book, or watching a TV show. And I think. Uh, what you do, like when you're playing on stage and what you're bringing to it, um, or what you might do when you write, is what we do to prepare, or like when you're rehearsing a song, right? What's your part in the song? What are you bringing to it? And some days, maybe you're not into it, right? And you're flat, or you're not there, but you can you still have something, or you're angry. And I think the same goes for acting, like, you're not always going to be able to have, you don't use the same emotion. Like in other words, for a scene, if I'm in the scene, you know, mad at my girlfriend's dad or whatever, and I have to say something to him and so my action is to put him in his place and I can use a past experience of mine and call upon that or I can use a completely different imaginary circumstance to bring up the emotion if I'm revved up that I can make it up in my head and then walk in and do the scene. So it doesn't have, and the same thing is for like, if you're writing a song, right? You might pull from an emotion that you once felt or an experience, but then that song's interpreted differently by those who listen to it. So when I was saying, your emotions are accessible as musicians and as songwriters and as artists. I think that's what it is with acting. But I think the bottom line is, man, it's all about the work. And mm -hmm. that's, and people don't, all the rest of the stuff comes like, it's about the discipline to find that accessibility within yourself and peel back the layers to get there. And I think it's about you guys pushing yourself as songwriters to find it and look, it comes more natural to some people than others, or maybe maybe over time it becomes easier and easier, or maybe you get lucky. 
but it's really all about the work that you put in and the discipline to either practicing your 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 instrument as a musician and as an actor it's your you know your body's your instrument and um yeah, there's so much. I don't want to get too thespian on you, but like doing the no, work. No, I, w- I want you to because like this is a stuff like I'm fucking jazz about to have you here. I think our listeners and viewers are, are as well. I mean, this is a different this is a different side of things. You know, um, you talk cool. to a lot of musicians here, obviously, but I, I love you explaining that. I mean, like you said, um, the work, but you started to describe the work that it takes to not, not only like you know, getting in there and working on it and blah, blah, blah. But I I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, you were starting to explain the work it takes to the inward work to, 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 to access that part, that part of you. Cause I do, I do agree. Uh, if you were going there anyway, that, uh, it is in everybody that, that artistic value is in everybody. That creative value is in everybody. You have to be able to, uh, I don't know, kind of be, Uh, an antenna or a beacon for it and let it all come in but and you have to be able to find it like on the inside like where you can pull from like it it is you have to be you have to be kind of an open book in a lot of respects so that you can you can tap into that um that vulnerability that it that it is to to have and then you you take out that vulnerability and then you mask it with something else (laughs) like you go like this is this is how i create yeah, and for all artists out there who do that, I think it's it's uh, you know uh, just what I need to say is thank you because art is so important, and I think it's really courageous too, right? Because it doesn't mean you're going to win or make money from it. Like if you decide, and it's hot, and it's jumping off a cliff, like every it usually it usually means the the opposite. <laughs> no, it's so sad. But yeah, but but to your point earlier of like just when you or what we were talking about earlier, like when you have something that you want to make. And you feel it. You, it doesn't matter if it's go, what it's going to do. Like that's yeah, not the point. You do got, it, you, right? And everyone's gonna have a fucking opinion. Good, bad, ugly, all of it in between. Like that's that's. And you have to you develop thick skin from it. Or some some of us are a little bit more born with thick skin. Mm-hmm. Again, tapping into that. Like if you've mm-hmm. if you've ha- if you've already experienced that in another avenue of your life, take it into your art. Take it into your you know, take that thick skin with you and go like, well, this is something to me when I put it out there. I'm totally okay with everyone fucking shitting on it. Yeah. And and you know, what's crazy is when you're that sort of like an open vessel and you're able to take things in and experience things and then maybe be able to reenact it in a scene, if you're an actor or on stage or in a song, if you're a musician, right? Um, that sort of vulnerability is like when I was talking about my uncle earlier, he, he, you know, he was an open, sensitive, sweet vessel and he went, it, it, his mind was affected. It, and I think the, the, the thing about it is too, is if you don't have thick skin, it does take time, but it's sort of crazy that you need to have thick skin, but you need to be open. Right. And that's why yeah. I think can turn to drugs and be influenced and, you know, depression. We all human beings can. So I'm not, but I think that it's, uh, it's fragile, man. The whole thing's fragile. It's nuts. And then you have to go and then me being this producer, bro, on this and being on the other side of the camera and seeing how it works with the money, you know, man, and the conversations and what that was crazy. But I thought that, look, man, I had so much passion for this script and for this character. And I wanted to tell the story so bad that I was, I, I needed, I knew that I needed to do, I wasn't going to wait around for my agents and for my managers. And I think all the actors that I saw that are very successful and on a big level, that's obviously your Clint Eastwood's, George Clooney's, Tom Cruise's, these guys mm-hmm. produce direct act right they do it all but it, like even obviously dennis leary the same thing we talked about yeah. what i learned from him but to, to have longevity you need to create your own work and i had so much passion for this story and and wanting to do it that i just able to sort of knock down walls and like well alan will tell you when you get the no is when the work starts and just uh and and just go you know and and again to bring it back to it's all about the work when we're talking about um, ourselves and and how you were asking me the similarities, and I wanted to go back to that for a second because, yeah. oh, here's what it is. Here's what I want to tell you about the work. 
Um, Let's do it. I'm going to want me to tell you a little bit about how I dug in to play this character in some of those. Yeah, movies. let's get there. Yeah, absolutely. Because I know you got kids too, and like we could get in, we could get into that too. Because playing off of that a bit, I would imagine I've got a young, I've got a young boy. I don't have a daughter, but I mean, still, like any parent yeah. who's watching this movie has had these thoughts. Let's be real. Exactly. And then when we talk about the work that you have to do, it's the same thing. Like if, as I said, if you're writing and you 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 and the guys can't find it or a moment or you're writing alone, you 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 peel back layers. You find it right, and then you go maybe go back and you change it. But with this, so I play this pastor right in this film, the small town. John Bishop. Bishop John. John, John Bishop. That's right. Uh, <laughs> but community. Um, one of the things in the script said he's a he's a rock star in this environment, right? And I was like, oh, so that means when he's giving his sermon, he's just open armed. He owns it. He loves the people. It's where he's most comfortable, right? That was one of the notes in there. He's a rock star in this community. So for the sermon part and the pastor part, I can't, I actually come from a religious background. I was an altar boy when I was younger, and and and, and you know I haven't been to church in a long time. Not that I don't uh, have faith, but that was my background. Background Catholicism when okay. I was and I, and I grew up. So anyway, um, I was able to draw on that, of course. But then this is a modern day pastor. So I went to these sermons. I sat in on sermons. I saw a bunch in Philadelphia and Jersey because that's where we started principal photography. So I went there for like I don't know a month earlier and did a lot of research. And they have bands in these, and it's a really cool way to spread the word because they celebrate. Right. And the writers actually go to a, a church like that. So that's how they were influenced by it. So I did that for that part, as well as many other things to study those scenes and how I would play the pastor and not thing that was important too is not make them pastory because that's cliche right and if you look at some of these modern day pastors they're just dudes right they're young they're right. hip they're into religion they listen to music but so then to get to the other part and we should talk about what it is the foundation of this film is built on this question if you had a minute alone with the person who killed your loved one would you take it and it's that teetering on that morality like revenge right it's the oldest mm -hmm. story in the book it's like shakespeare writing about love it's a primal instinct and um that is what the movie's about at its core but it's interesting because it's told through a man of the cloth who's now posed with this question when something terrible happens to his daughter and you right. said earlier let's start there okay so you get this part and you're like, okay, how do you relate to that? So I have a six-year-old boy. He said, you have a son. Now, it's not nice to do it, but you, you could imagine if someone did something or caused harm to them. So it's, if, you, if you're a parent, you already have a shoe in, right? If you're not, then you start thinking, okay, you know, niece, nephew, uh, uh, maybe a dog, cat pet right you just start thinking right, anything right okay you start so you start thinking about it and you really have to put the work in and sit with yourself and really experience what that would be like and how you would feel and it goes deeper than that then then uh uh that's just you know on the surface and then and then um i saw this youtube video man that was crazy it was a guy who if you were to cast him in a film, he looked like a math teacher, right? He was a thin man. And he has, this is a true story. He has this moment to tell his, his son's killer in court after the guy was convicted to tell him, uh, to, to address him. And he starts to do it. And the two court security guys are on, a, on one to his left, one to his right. And he lets out this howl from like the depths of his soul. It was like an animalistic, like, and it came out and I was like, it completely gave me chills. And he jumps over the, 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 the barrier and he starts stabbing the guy with a pencil. And the, the, the court security people pull him off, but you could almost see like they understand, you know, it wasn't like the guy oh, was- Yeah, they're like, they're like, fuck, I'd do it too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And uh, that was a great shoe in too for research of what my character and what you would feel if someone did do harm to your kids. 
So then you take that, right? You take that nugget and you go there with your imagination and then you pull for more. And, uh, and, and that, that is how I, I, I started to put who this character was together, all these layers. But here's the crazy part. And this is the important part. It's always about the pinch, never the ouch. So you find all that homework and then you put it inside of you. And then you just put your two feet on the ground in the scene and you listen and answer and you're in it and you live truthfully under these imaginary circumstances, but you don't try to push for that result. It's really important. It's like, like if you met somebody who was at a concentration camp and did, you know, or, 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 or went through that experience when you meet them or when you're with them, they're not wearing that all the time. Right. But they have right. that experience or if their parents were or whatever. So it's sort of like that kind of work. You have to build it all inside and then trust it's there and then play the scene, live under those interesting. circumstances. And, and I think that's what, People try to push, you know, for that emotion or what the scene might mean. And you really have to leave it alone and let it be in there and trust it's there. So there's that in building for it. But again, man, it's really about the discipline and the work and like, you know, and then you get better at it. You get it. Be, it and I, I imagine that's how it might be like songwriting or learning a song or, you know, uh, 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 and then the other thing was producing on this was a, I, I would go back to after a 12, 14 hour day on set, have to take a long shower on some days to get some of that fake blood out, off and, uh, and then have to put out the fires for the next day. You know, whether it was, we changed, we couldn't get this location, this, the grip had an issue. So now we need to replace them for the next day or whatever it is. So I didn't, and I was stressed with COVID. Oh, I could go on and on about those. There were a lot of, uh, yeah. you know, the screen actors guild put a lot of, um, there were protocols. We got shut down, even though no one on set got it, but someone who was on their way to set came positive because we had to test people. with. So all this stuff yeah. wore me down. And I was able to use that for my character because he's worn down after the first it's act. Definitely so, fuck you. You'd definitely be worn down after. after yeah, the bro. Shot, uh, so you just through. use, you use everything, you know? And uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, I, I, I really, I love talking about it. And that's why I love the parts of directing the most, because as a producer, you don't get into this stuff we're talking about. You're trying to get the production done, get to location, get to set. Yeah, a lot of, yeah. I wanted to ask you, because from my understanding too, there's, I don't know which producer, you said that there's a lot of different, uh, there's line producer, uh, creative producer, but which producer is it that goes out um, and gets the producing credits for this, obviously goes out and shops the movie once it's filmed and stuff like that, what might go find. Um, it's kind of like the way it was kind of described to me kind of sounds like something in the stock market or something like that, or like selling a, uh, like kind of a, a small business gets sold, you know, it might get parceled off or rights to where it's going to be streamed later and such and such yeah. and such. Like, is that, is that one of the producer hats you wore on this as well? Or is that, a, uh, is that, am I describing that job accurately? Either. Yeah. So what you do is you're going to get distribution now for the film to come out. And that could be theatrical distribution. In this case, we came out in theaters. We're out in theaters now, but then also all your other ancillaries outside of theatrical, which are digital. So VOD, right. streaming, Blu-ray, all that stuff. And Alan is the master. So he Alan's is, that, okay. oh man, he's, he's unbelievable. And he's, he's obviously familiar with, as you mentioned, he did, he did the dirt already. So he's, you know. But here's the cool part, man. He, it's a testament. He let me, I was on every phone, every, every, uh, mostly every call uh, with distributors, with Alan. So I got oh, to wow. hear him do his business thing. And I learned so much in terms of how he wanted to sell the film, what his vision was with what is with working with his algorithms, rhythms and his data and what we, how he planned and planned on marketing this with the soundtrack. Like there's an old school, we're doing like an old vinyl soundtrack with this. Oh dude, you know what I didn't tell you too, besides the great music, Remember the wink at the 80s? I told you this film. We yeah, got yeah. Stranger Things guys, Kyle Dixon and Michael Stein, to score this movie. Okay. Another, <laughs> okay, okay. Another okay. huge, uh, another huge score. Scores. Oh, yeah. uh, I like what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't really mean it. But, but yeah, it was. 
And uh, so anyway, we're going to, you know, I think it's out. You can get it digitally now the soundtrack but it's also going to come yeah. out on vinyl and it's going to be like you know splatted with blood and really cool collectors sure items. that's going to be i know vinyls uh usually come out uh like you said collector's items uh there's you only press so many of them can i can i uh can i put myself down for a pre-order of one of those i, I got i have a record collection at home and i'd love to have it in there Done, dude. I got your. I got you covered. You got to give me your number after this, and as soon as I get it. Absolutely. I'd love to stay in touch anyway, but yeah. I, outside of outside of uh, asking for a favor there, but I'd love to stay in touch Thank anyway. You. Yeah, absolutely. And then I think they're going to be done around Christmas, so I'll, I'm going to put you it down for one. I'm psyched to get a, a couple. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, a hundred percent. And then, uh, and then when it comes in, I'll send it to you. But. Um, yeah, man. So it's crazy because all this stuff I've just, I learned, I told you from like Leary who produced and starred and created, I didn't, what I brought from, and then learning so much from Alan and, and, and the business side, I've done a few re uh, interviews with him for like billboard magazine or Polestar and like to hear him go off on the data algorithms and what his plan is and what, how he knows his artist. And, you know, he's, uh, he's incredible, man. I, I've been able to get, I, I like, I was more of a creative producer. And in this case, there's money producers who just literally, they might never even be around. They just put up money like executive producers or see, I think on film executive producers are more money guys, but on TV, the executive producers are the creatives, but on oh, this. So there's a difference. So there's a difference even between film and TV. See, again, I'm like learning about the produce, like it was always elusive to me, to be completely honest, what producer meant in film. I just assumed film and TV were the same because it, because again, it means something so different in music as you know, a producer on, a, on an album is yeah. not doing any of what you're just describing. So, right. <laughs> so it's, just, it's, way, such, like, it's such a odd thing. It is. It's, a, it's, it's the same. I think like on TV, executive producer is like the main dog. And I think in right. film producer or produced by, is the main title that's the that's that's the difference but they both will do the same thing it's just that on tv the highest level of producer is executive and on film it's producer but under executive on tv there's a producer and by the way the co-producer may be end up doing more than a producer may you know like you don't but those those are the and then there's co-producer co-executive producer you know co-associate producer and it just goes down but it's a collaborative effort to make a film that means locations paying the crew picking the crew hiring directors monitoring the director all that stuff you know it sounds like like as you said uh the producer if you wanted to wrap it all into one job it would be an insurmountable task for one person to do. So that's where you, depending on the size of, of the, uh, the, I don't know what you want to call it, the, the project, pro the production, yeah. you might yeah. have anywhere from, you know, anywhere from three to 15 producers. It sounds like it could go up to. And I, I wanted to ask on that too. You said you had like 50 crew members on this one, um, on this film. I've only done music videos of, you know, however many crew I'd have to think of how many and try and count the faces in the, in the room. But, uh, is, is, is 50, um, how would you gauge that for, uh, different, uh, productions that you've been on? Is that, is that a bigger number or a smaller number or what, was it like everyone like yourself was kind of doing a few jobs, uh, at the same time that you usually might be able to on a, on a bigger, on a bigger production, have more people doing that, uh, spread out a little bit more. Yeah. This is a nice crew. This, uh, first of all, the crew's amazing. I mean, as people, I'm saying, oh, yeah, I'm sure. yeah, person yeah. Crew. and it's all about your crew, man. Like I give these guys oh, yeah. the loyalty, like, you know, you're definitely having brews at the end of the day with your crew. These guys work. We, so call, we call them roadie Fridays on, on the road. I don't know if you ever got to do touring with, uh, with Apache, uh, stuff, yeah. but uh, if you did, I want to get into those, those stories too, but <laughs> yeah, on, uh, on the road, we call them roadie Fridays. You get Everyone in the crew, you know, we, we've amassed a pretty big crew when we go out there and do our thing, too. And yeah. uh, as you said, man, none of this shit, none of the shit that you and I get to do on whatever level of entertaining people happens without all these guys coming together and helping and, and making it really happen. Right. Oh, man, man. Fuck. No. Um, these. They, so so on this, you know, we had stunts. So you got you have a stunt coordinator and then maybe a couple other assistants under him. So 
I'm sort of saying everything, you know, there was so much on this, your wardrobe girls, like the head of wardrobe, and then maybe two assistants who she's working her tail off. She's amazing. Uh, obviously your camera department, you got your DP, it's the director of photography. That's the man. And then he's got his AC, who's his camera assistant guy who pulls focus. So like, there's a dude there literally pulling the focus on the camera while your DP, some DP shoot, some don't. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It just blew my mind because I'm sitting here thinking every time I'm just now I, from doing this show I've, I've and my uh, my director and uh, and uh, editor, um, he used to do in person with me and then he, he in, and he lived in Southern California. This is going to be a long story for a second here. And then yeah. he moved out to uh, to Pennsylvania um, back home when he had a kid. He wanted to be close to family. So I bought some stuff and I record. I do it all myself, set up the tripods and, and do everything and then send it to him. And but so in that I'm learning how to focus in a camera, give it a little bit of depth so that, you know, this this looks all pretty and that looks all blurred, you know, like yeah. <laughs> like all this all this good stuff, the focus you're describing. So when I'm watching a movie, I'm like, damn, these guys are fucking good just sitting there like moving in and out. And I'm like, dude, that to do that at the same time, man, that's why they go to school and study this stuff. But you just, you just, you just broke a little kayfabe. I'm using a wrestling term there. You just broke a little kayfabe for me there. Like, so there's, there's a guy literally on that focus helping do that while, while the other guy's holding it in place. That's, that's crazy. And our DP will do it by hand too, but there, the guy there's a, he has his own monitor and it's a remote control with a, a dial. So right. I've seen those guys on the music videos. Okay. I didn't realize what they were doing. <laughs> yeah. And they have to watch the screen and it could go, it could go sharp or flat. Meaning, you know, it, it, you're so, so if we're doing, we do a rehearsal. So if I'm doing a push in on you and I'm mm-hmm. going to end up on a, you know, super close up, but I started from way out here. And sometimes if it's a quick push in too, you he's got to go. He's got to go, dude. And the whole time, it can't be sharp or flat. Like, so it'll be either blurry or two. The whole time as it's moving in, he's dialing that thing in. It's ever- that's pretty. Cra- that's pretty crazy. That's like that's like they got to be in, uh, in in sync on that. Those two different guys doing that, man. That's yes. that's 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 super interesting to dude, me. That whole I, camera I, crew that they put the camera together every single day. They take it apart, put it together. Like these guys are nuts, man. They're awesome. And then you have your, you know, all. All your 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 grips who are carrying all the lights for the DP who's like okay there then they come back they'll put a shade up over it you know maybe I have bags under my eyes maybe I'm supposed to whatever it is so mm-hmm. so they're doing uh it, it's unbelievable so you have each department um doing their thing and in this case you know a 50 person crew is a nice crew for this budget film it's good but you know rescue me I think was like a hundred per episode every day for, mm-hmm. for the hundred episodes. Uh, wow. And, you know, last night's huge movie, I was in Prague. We were talking about the one with Clive Owen, Morgan Freeman, Kazuyuki mm-hmm. Ihara directed that. He's a Japanese director. He's amazing. I was in Prague for four months filming that thing in castles all over locations. That was a huge crew, but we were doing scenes with hundreds and hundreds of extras fighting in castles. Yeah. And- you got to do all those battle scenes and everything. Like yeah. that's, that's next. Yeah. And uh, how much, I mean, that's, we, we on the, uh, in the, in the chairs, in the movie theaters, get to see all the A footage edited down and everything. You're not getting into all that. When you're talking about a big battle scene, all that B, C, D footage that is just picking up that you're like, I don't know if we're going to use this, but we're making it look as good as possible in case that editor in the room wants it later, you know? Yeah, man, it, exactly. And then doing that, you felt like, so I felt like such a badass. Like I was one of Clive's like right-hand men. It's like basically Morgan Freeman's like the emperor. Then Clive Owens, the next guy. And there's thousands of knights, but it's about his group of five knights. So I was one of his guys. But anyway, the point is, these are like, uh, these guys are uh, Czechoslovakian stuntmen. They're amazing. We're shooting knights in old castles. And literally we'd choreograph where I'm just going, I'm going like, this and they're just there's hundreds of them walking at you know running at me from different angles and then I'm the last guy standing and you feel like it's <laughs> and they're like flipping falling off the side of the building so. that's gotta be the fun that's the fun stuff like I mean I, I I've never acted or anything like that but I mean again going back to something I think we could both relate on is having a kid a, a young son 
you get to, I mean, I, I get a little taste of acting when I'm, when I'm playing imaginary shit with him, you know, and like, so I got to imagine that feels good as an adult to like be like, like even oh. it, just that feeling you described of be, being a badass, you know what I mean? It, in a medieval time. I want to tell you this, Johnny, you're already naturally dialed in because what you just said is everything. You get to play with your kid, right? And kids have the most open minds. And what happens is through life, we're taught, hey, don't cry. Hey, don't do this. Behave this way. Sit up this way. So then when you go as an actor, you have to reverse that and make it access accessible. Yeah. The kids are just these beautiful open vessels, you know, and they're so sweet. Or if they're hungry, they'll just freaking cry. <laughs> it's all right there is the point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. So I see the same thing in my kid all the time. And I'm like, wow. And it's weird because I'll be like, uh, you know, I, I, this is beautiful. He's crying. And I don't want to be like, hey, don't cry. But then obviously my wife takes care of it. But uh, it's just, <laughs> uh, all the wives, we love them. Yeah. Love them. <laughs> she's, she's tougher than me. So anyway, um, but yeah, it's a fine line because I want him to be this beautiful, you know, open thing, but he can't be a not either. So you have to, I guess you live to you, you learn to live within rules and boundaries set by society, but then for what we do and to communicate and allow people to tap into their imagination and get crazy, right? We have to be able to make the other side accessible to them. And that's what we do through music and, and film or whatever the medium might be. I, I'm glad you brought that up because it is something I was just talking to somebody else about too. And something I, I I've been thinking a little bit more about lately because I didn't really until I'm starting to get a little bit older. It's not something I really think about, but we never, we never have to grow up in the, in the, in the worlds that we that we live in. We sure you do in, in the everyday life and stuff like that. But I mean, like our imagination still gets to run wild. We still, you know, we, it, it's, it's, it's an absolute blessing that we get to play what we, or, and do what we love. And I think you can do that in a lot of other, you know, for the people at home watching or listening, you can find whatever that means to you and you get to still feel young. I think that's part of everyone wanting to feel young, the age old thing. Um, I bring all that up though. Cause like it is an absolute blessing. So glad to have it. But then I don't know about for you, but like I'm a, I'm approaching, you know, 40 years old and I'm going like, wow, I still feel 15, like in my head. Now, and obviously not my body so much. You know, I've done I've done a couple of things there, but you know, like like you know, I'm like, wow, like I've never, I've never really had to grow up until you have a kid, and then it starts to humble you, and you start doing those kind of things. Is it? Can you relate to any of what I'm saying right here? Hundred percent, all the way across. On this one, I learned to do a lot more business. So I was telling you through Alan and that side of it, and producing the film more than I've ever done. I always step on set. I'm an actor, you know, but, but I, I always admired again, Dennis and his work ethic because he was an actor, but then he also had to deal with all these issues. So it's been good for me. I've grown up a lot through this, but I still love playing man. And I honestly did this whole movie to play that character to act, to keep my dream of acting going and wanting to play. So I had to, you know, I'm never worried about the work, honestly, for me. I'm not. I come from my father's such a hard worker. That's all he does. It's like, you know, and that's like digging ditches work kind of work, you know, like. Yeah. And uh, so I did all this to create my own opportunity to play, I guess. And at, at everything, you, I think that sort of answers. And I agree with you with what you just said. You know, we get to play. <laughs> and. You know, you have a responsibility, though, when you're doing your shows and all these kids and people are buying tickets. It's it's such a business, too, man. You know, it's crazy. And it's yeah. nice. You can do both. And I think as we are getting older, we're able to understand the other side of it a lot more. And that's good. Yeah. And on that business thing, I'll just touch on that real quick. Um, I appreciate you saying it because it, it, it is for us like, yeah, sure. We get to reap the benefits of our hard work and our creativity and our art and stuff. But as as you mentioned, you know, 50, 50 uh, member crew alone on the on this uh, movie, not to mention hundred member crews on other things that you're saying, and uh, not just the crews, other actors. Uh, it's <laughs> not to go all economical, but it creates a lot of fucking jobs too, and you end up being the one in charge, you know, and uh, in in a lot of respects, rather. So it's kind of like 
like, yes, this is this is great. I love doing it. I would do this if there was no fucking money in it. But <laughs> there happens to be. So I'm going to so let, let's let's be real here. And I'm going to, you know, and along the way, there's a lot of people. I mean, you mentioned COVID and stuff like I was I'm fortunate enough to be able to sit back and it, it, take the silver lining in that and stay home with my kid. That was that was amazing for me. Mm. And I know for a lot of other people, for a lot of different reasons, it was not the case, Espe especially when you talk about crew members and stuff that are used to being on the road. They are living paycheck to paycheck, to paycheck more often than not, hopping from one band to another and staying on the road even more than the, you know, I, I, I like to think that I'm on the road a lot when I'm in, in a cycle. These guys are, when I go home, they're going to the other gig, you know, and... Uh, yeah. It's 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 insane how how many of our old crew members that I loved, um, unfortunately, just couldn't stay in the industry that they loved and had to get uh, nine to five jobs at home and construction and stuff like that. Ugh. Man, yeah, COVID changed a lot of things. Huh? That will never go back. Even like for office people who don't have offices now because they started working remotely, and then. Obviously, it affected everyone and us for the arts where you need people to congregate, congregate, whether it's you and your mm -hmm. bandmates rehearsing, putting on a show, right, recording. We need people together. If you're an actor doing a play, making a movie, whatever it is. Uh, and it, it's been it took a toll. Like, you know, the other thing that was crazy, man, for this, the uh, the covid tests when they first came out. It was like five or six hundred dollars a test to get the quick turnaround. Wow, you guys had to get those all the time because of the SAG stuff. Wow. When we were in Vegas, well, we were outside of Vegas in Henderson, Nevada. We filmed. We shot there nineteen days. I got twenty-two COVID tests, and uh, that's that's how a big part of your budget that gets cut right there, bro. right? Because that's got to come from somewhere. Yes. And that was the thing of why it's so difficult to, it was difficult to make anything for anybody during these times because it was so expensive. But again, Alan, I mean, we had to, we were treated, we were at one time we were shooting in Connecticut and the guy, the SAG guy rep, because we had multiple locations for where musicians were going back to get reshoots and do things. And the guy came to set a SAG rep and he said, you're the second to last production in the world filming and i'm like what and he's like yeah there's one in arizona actually and we so i said okay well you stay there in your tent because we're a bubble now right our crew's been together and we were starting to freak out and then we ended up wrapping that was in when it started happening i think in march 20 right so that's, that's right yeah beyond. and uh so we got maybe it was a 10 day shoot maybe we filmed seven or eight of the days and then i'm like i gotta let these people go because i was so driven because hey, there's so much money every day you're shut down i had yeah. so much stress you wearing mo wearing those multiple hats too you're like director you know like, like we yeah. said you're acting in it you want to get it done you know and then then yeah. you, that, that 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 other voice comes in and goes like the money and you're like ah oh, fuck i forgot about that now i gotta now i gotta focus on that yeah ex exactly so yeah, there were so many, but Alan said, man, keep going. We, we, we shoot till we get it. So then we'd go back out. We got shut down like three times from different locations. We'd go home, regroup. You know, in some cases it gave us, gave me a little time to put some perspective and maybe rework a scene with the writers. And then I had this mm. Randy Bricker who edited the film and he's amazing. He was, he goes so far back as he was a, a, a an a apprentice editor on the movie the firm with tom cruise he worked on oh, i am shit. great movie great movie <sighs> great movie dude i am legend which i actually also loved oh another amazing movie dude that's one are we just gonna like go we just name a bunch of movies that i love that, that, that we could just finish up that with at the end of the yeah. show <laughs> yeah exactly what's your favorite horror do you have one or one that moved you a lot or are you oh, not even into that's it? tough that's tough because uh um yeah this will probably be really i mean this is the uh the idea here we are not getting close to october or by the time this comes out it might even be october i don't know this yeah. might be our halloween episode i don't know yet we have we have a few banks so we'll see this might be the halloween if it is happy halloween everybody um but uh <laughs> Uh, yeah. so you asked the question, yeah, the, for me, if I go to like, you know, just like, like with music and stuff, everyone has like their one or two that they like is from a childhood that you always go back to yeah. like Metallica or something like that. Yeah. I think, I think for me, it's Nightmare on Elm Street and because, and just the entire franchise, of course, the first movie grabbed me. I was a fucking, I was like 
four or five when I first saw the movie. Yeah. Uh, because I have two older brothers and oh. I would sit at the top of the, I, they would have like their movies, movie nights with sleepovers with their, with their friends or older, obviously yeah. pizza and everything downstairs in the living room. I was supposed to go to bed. I'd sit at the top of the steps and watch the movie <laughs> from the top of the steps, you know? And, uh, and my mom and my dad didn't know that this was happening until I started having nightmares about Freddie. And they're like, how the fuck do you know about Freddie? And I'd go around like, like with my fingers, like claws during the day and shit. They're like, how does he even know about Freddie? And I was like, oh. I finally had to come clean. But, uh, anyways, long story on that one, but yes, Freddie was it for me from that very early age. It scared the absolute piss out of me. Yeah. And then, uh, growing, you know, and then growing up rewatching it the entire franchise the evolution of freddy in the nightmare franchise with with robert england yeah it became it became comical in such a beautiful way yeah. uh, it's like, it so cool it'd be it, it went on to that army of darkness realm and evil dead as you mentioned earlier that i was just like this is so awesome i love that and then you know we were out on the road one time and all of us went to go see a movie back in the day still in the van days you know, like, oh, we need air conditioning. We're in the Midwest right now. It's fucking summertime. Let's go see a movie. Yeah. Freddy versus Jason was playing, and we fucking went in there. <laughs> Keistered a few beers in, in, in the trench coat I, I had. You know, we came in, sat in the movie theater, drank a bunch of beers, and watched Freddy versus Jason, and oh. couldn't be happier. Dude, that's amazing. Yeah, I keep thinking, first of all, Nightmare on Elm Street, I agree. That's one of, one of mine, too. Scared the fuck out of me. And uh, it was such a great concept. But you know that shot where his arms get long too. His arms, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. and especially at the time, you got to remember, like kids yeah. who are who are just discovering this now, like may not think of it as that crazy. But like, dude, that was that was some high tech shit going on. There. <laughs> uh, it was. You especially know, for a horror that, movie, you know? totally. And and uh, and you know, like uh, obviously Friday the Thirteenth. How about mm. like what was so huge with that though? The score too. Remember that. All of it. Yo, dude, I used to go around. I like we used to when we play, I think there was a game we played. It was kind of a version of tag. And I didn't I've never I've completely forgot about it until you just did that. And I'm like, we used to play Jason and it was a version of tag and it had to do. I can't remember the entire. Uh, wow. I'm going to have to ask my brothers about it. Cool. But yeah. I used to go around outside doing the. Ch -ch 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 and it was part of the game. I don't remember. I think if you were it, you had to do that or something. And it was like, uh, yeah, so, something cool. along those lines. But yeah. Oh, okay, another the, one. the theme songs, though. Like, so, so, I mean, John Carpenter in the day doing all uh, that, uh, doing Halloween. I mean, how, oh, wait. I, have you had access to seeing the the, the end of Halloween? What, what's it called? Halloween Jamie, ends. I haven't, Halloween ends. I haven't seen it yet. I have not, but you know what's crazy? Ryan Freeman, he's a producer on that, helped me out a lot uh, with this movie. And oh, rad. I, I saw some photos behind the scenes. I haven't, I don't think he'd give it to me anyway, but I didn't even ask him. But he's become a friend through this experience. One of the writers knew him. And so I've developed a good relationship with him. But yeah, dude, oh, that's so anticipated too. I can't, you think it's really. I love the last one. I love it. No, it can't. Who cares if it is? I don't care one way or the other. I really, I could care less if it's the end or not. I'm going to go fucking see the movie. Yeah. I love the last one. The last one, like a lot of people say, oh, it's this, it's that. And I'm like, you guys knew it was a Halloween movie, right? Like, what what, what were you expecting when you were going into that movie? Like, yeah. and I love it. Like the, one of my favorite scenes when I knew it was just pure brilliance was when she when like the cheerleader tries to shoot the gun in the last Halloween one and it turns around somehow and shoots her. I'm like, that's just awesome. That's just, I love that shit. This is why I love horror movies. It's so, right. like, what do we, what are like, let's, let's get into the fantasy world here. Like yeah. I want to I go into that world when I'm watching a horror movie. And if I get taken out of it for a second, it's comical. It's funny. It's like, Oh, that's hilarious. All right, let's get back in. Like, yeah. There are, and, and there are, and there is a lot to say about some of the, 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 the more in depth horror movies too, like uh, you know the Jordan Peele movies that are out, and yeah. uh, I can name it, whoever else ones you know. Uh, Shyamalan does you know I don't know if those are considered horror, but back to that, who cares what genre it really is? It's kind of in that world. Um, That's right. And then I mean even this one, the Retaliators, man, the concept, the, the storyline, the, it is. I mean I don't want to give too much away from those who maybe haven't seen it yet, um, but I mean it's not. 
it's not just what the trailer shows. Let's let's put it that way. You yeah. know. And it, I, I I love that. Thank you, man. Me too. And then I got to tell you the last one too, and you can't, we can't not mention this Jaws, man. Jaws, like if I'm in a Ooh. swimming pool, I see the Sharks POV, right? That and the score <laughs> again, the score, score, so good. So my good. son, back to so my son's been wanting to watch Jaws. I still won't let him because I remember the same way you did. It's how much it scared the shit out of me. Yeah, and I was born and raised in Orange County, Huntington Beach. I oh. had to do junior lifeguards, which is uh, something that we do. Um, and I was deathly afraid because of Jaws and the multiple Jaws that had come out by that point. Yeah. Um, that I had seen of doing the pier swim where we have to swim around the pier. I'm like, fuck oh, that, oh, man. What are you talking about? So we do a lot out, out in the open water swimming. And I'm, and my son's going to do junior guards too at some point. He's too young yet. But, yeah. And he's also probably too young to see Jaws. I'm also like, dude, I don't want to take you to the beach after you've seen Jaws and deal with that. I'm sorry. Like, yeah, I, just, I know it's going to make you think about it. I know you're going to think about it. And the reality is... I'm a surfer now. I go out to the beach very often. Wow, cool. The reality, the reality of it, especially in Huntington Beach, is nothing's really going to happen. You have to be one of those freak things. Yeah. And if that if that happens to you, that I'm sorry, you just got you got dealt a bad hand. I don't know what to tell you. Like it's just it's very rare that that shit actually happens. You know. Yeah, so. dude. I, I'll tell you the first. That's sick. You're from Huntington Beach. Uh, that's where the writers are actually, and uh, so I've spent time there. It's yeah. When you said Orange County, I was like, I wonder which part of Orange County. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the theater, which is funny, at Huntington Beach sold out the first like two or three nights. And at Bellaterra, I saw that. I saw that. I was I was <laughs> home for a minute. I was like, I was getting ready to take my wife out to like a date night. And I was like, oh, let's see what movies are playing. And oh. Retaliators is one of the movies. And I was like, oh, but I'm working on having Michael on the show right now. And I have the screeners. So do we go see it in theaters? And oh, it was like right. between that and a couple other ones. Yeah, yeah. So, what did you see? Do you remember? Or did I don't you remember? Know? It wasn't as good as the Retaliators. So Thank you, man. Cares. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, you know, um, thanks for having me. I, I know. Uh, I, I just thought it was. It's what's amazing is um, being able to had have that experience with music, and then being able to be around musicians on a film set, right, and have this. Because obviously acting worked for me and that's where I was able to make my career and, and you know, uh, but it's crazy because I think the two do go hand in hand and how crazy is it that now I'm, 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 an, I'm an actor who produced this movie and with all these incredible musicians and soundtrack, it's crazy. You said you, at the beginning, you said you got all those, uh, uh, Alan gave you just straight up everyone's numbers to call. Are yeah. you, I, I mean... Obviously, you guys spent a lot of time, and I'm sure you're friends with every one of those musicians yes. that that was that was on the set. I mean, you've been you're helping direct and produce them while they're while they're getting into character, that's yeah. a, and working on a project like that. Uh, that's a good bond right there. Is there anyone that's like standing out though that you're still like like, like is more of a daily or a weekly chat even that like you're staying uh -huh. real close with? So, you know, what's cool is I saw Five Finger uh, play at Jones Beach uh, last uh, month. Okay. Or, yeah, like, yeah, I think it was last Monday or the Monday that before. The, was Megadeth on that? Uh, on yeah. That? Okay, cool. Yeah, Megadeth and the band The Who, the Mongolian rock band, H.U. These guys are... They have, and they're on your uh, soundtrack for The Retaliators. Yeah. I hadn't heard of them, and I was listening to the soundtrack. I was kind of had like a Rammstein feel to it a little bit, but like with like an old like rock and roll bar feel to it as well somehow meld melding amazing you gotta see these yeah. guys. their instruments are oh that's the other thing we did music videos i got to direct a few music videos that crossroads you did the bad yeah and the bad wolves one with doc Coyle and uh and spencer uh, yeah that oh yeah that was like more cut footage but yeah that one but i did oh, okay alexandria we did one that was like its own, but it crosses roads. Faded Out was the song. Mm -hmm. I did one with Hyro the Hero. Uh, who's that playing on your radio? I did one and we set it's set in an old cemetery. It's really, it's like a nod to Thriller. It's like, they're all 70s, sort of gritty, grindhousey, fun, throwback videos that crossroads with the film and help promote it. There's a sizzle on there of the movie at the end. Um, but yeah, you know, so all the guys, I have to tell you, Everyone's very busy. They're out on the road. I spoke with Spencer like right. this past week, uh, the Five Finger guys, Hyro, I got to do the video with. So yeah, I'm honestly, Eva Marie from Eva Under Fire, 
And also with Instagram, now you can see what people are up to all the time. I yeah. shouldn't say now it's been around, but I'm into it a little bit more and just reaching out and talking. So literally yeah. everyone, um, I just have a lot of respect for them. And what's so cool is I know all these songs so well because I've been in the editing room. I've seen this movie a thousand times and placing them. So like Jacoby's song, the ending, it opens the movie. It's such a great yep. song. Uh, you know, I, I should say Papa Roach's song because all those guys, right, we, right, right. I've worked on that music video for the ending as well. So all those dudes are just sick. Yeah, we did, we did some tours with them uh, back in the day. We got to know them. Uh, love those dudes. Yeah, it's totally. so much fun. We had, we had a lot of fun together on the road. We'll talk about um, that when we get each other's numbers I, afterward. Jesus, man, I could only imagine. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, man, uh, thank you. I, I need to tell you, like, I can go on and on. You know, what's crazy is I told you about the origin of this film, um, uh, uh, that concept of what would you do if you had a minute alone, that, that revenge concept. Do you know the last little nugget here? I've kept you for a long time, but is that that this film is inspired by true events. And this is really crazy. So not the things we reenact, it's not like a reenactment or this happened in the movie, but that concept of wanting revenge and why something happened to the writers that inspired them. And they wrote this script as a way to heal. Wow. It's crazy. You want to hear it? Man. Or can maybe. Yes, absolutely. No, yes, please. I've got all the. You're not cutting me off, buddy. It, it, I got all the time in the world today. So, like, this, this is all you. You want to keep going? I would love to. Uh, if not, we could put a pin on it and we'll do a follow up call. I'm going to be asking you for a follow up phone call anyway at some point. But yeah, let, I would love to hear that story. I, would, I wasn't sure how personal story. that is. Yeah. So, let me tell you this. So, uh, so the Gear Brothers, they. Uh, several years ago, um, about 12 years ago, their sister was brutally attacked. And uh, she, she, the way I'm going to take, take you through the details. As a young girl, they were like, oh, my God, Michael, you wouldn't believe she was always such a tough kid. So when they were like 12, she was eight. She was the kind of kid that if you started messing around and fighting with her, she would like grab onto your leg and never stop. Right. She was always a tough kid. So cut to, she's around 18 years old, about 12 years ago. I think it could be 18 years ago now, but she's, she's 18 years old. She's at a party in Northern California with her girlfriends. They're at one girlfriend's house. They're all hanging out and they decide to go to another house. So they all go. She takes her own separate uh, route there and she's walking and it's near the freeway. She's walking and she said she felt someone like jogging up from behind her. And she's like, this is so odd. It's midnight and someone's jogging. This is now this is her talking and you should know she's very outspoken about this story. She wants the story told. So she's like, this is so odd. She literally said, it's as if you looked out the window right now and saw a dragon. <laughs> All of a sudden the guy tackles her down a ravine. She rolls down this ravine and she starts fighting with the guy. She's fighting for her life. He's punching her, beating her. He puts a belt around her neck and strangles her. So now she, she gets not, you know, she, she nods out. She's out. And he brutally, he raped her. And then the next thing you know, she comes awake and she hears him sort of like in the distance walking away. She lies there for a second. She climbs up the ravine like half dressed, you know, clothes ripped off, ripped apart. She runs up to the freeway and she said she went to the middle of the freeway where cars were coming both way to make sure both ways to make sure she someone saw her. She hails a car, they get her, take her to the hospital. She does the rape test, ever the kit, everything. And uh, to make sure she gets the DNA, she does all, she said she went into the bathroom and she looked in the mirror and it was the first time she had seen herself and she was pulverized, beaten terribly. Fuck. She has to call her mom. Her mom comes and she said, she said to her mom, don't tell dad. Like that's how much. And of course her dad's going to, you know, going to know. But wow. she's, so, so get this. She goes through the whole process um, and they never catch the guy. 
So now years go by. They never catch the guy. Cut to about five years ago. And we should have her on to tell the story because I could be all I love that. Yeah. Just you know, she's wonderful. So get, but I'm giving you the story. This is because I've heard it a bunch from her and talked with her about it, but my dates might be off. So get this five years ago, approximately there's a woman in a taxi cab in Northern California. She's a, uh, she, the guy pulls off to this desolate, weird little turnaround and rapes the lady and she escapes. She like runs. I don't know if he like, how far, if he got her, if she escaped first, she takes the police back to there. They scour the area. They find a used condom like off to the side. They do the test on it. It matches Jody Gears, the Gear brother's little sister from 12 years earlier. They get the guy, right? Now, they're going through trial. They're seeing their dad had to live with this for years. Their family, there's a lot of brothers and sisters. They're a beautiful family. So now they have to sit through trials. Their dad has to, their sister has to go through it of seeing this guy. And there was one juror, I think it would be life in prison, who didn't give him life, who didn't agree with it because the belt was the attempted murder thing. And Mm -hmm. so anyway, they go through all this. And the one brother, Darren, says to his brother, Jeff, you know, imagine if there was a service where you could, someone could get this guy and you could have a minute alone with him. And they started talking about that concept and wrote the retaliators as a, a, a way to creatively heal through this process. Fuck, so, the man. Film, yeah. So, the film, The Retaliators, as I told you, is built on this concept of revenge. And there they go to church. Darren has four kids and and he thought about how bad what he would do to this guy for what he did to their family and that's where the retaliators is born from and um and then get this part of it jody gear was in firefighter school when this happened to her she be- dude right she became a proby and her favorite show, the probationary firefighter, was Rescue Me. Because, and my, I was her favorite character. This is her talking. And by the way, her brothers never, Darren and Jeff, when I was writing music with them, didn't know this. Because she was in Northern California. They're in Southern California. They're spread out all over. That It wasn't, I was, some, it wasn't something they were talking about. They never regularly. talked about it, that I was writing with them. So wow. her, I was her favorite character on Rescue Me. And she used the show as a way to heal and laugh because the show showed firefighters as flawed human beings. And she was flawed in dealing with her demons of what she dealt with through this experience of being attacked. And she'd have nightmares, of course. So she saw through this show that, wow, these FDNY guys, because the show was depicted in a very real way. And we did a lot of charities and talked to real firefighters. So she followed it and it helped her, it made her laugh. It helped her through this. And then get this, you ready? She is now all these years later, one of the few female firefighter captains in America. She made captain. Wow, man! It's a hero win story over all these years. Well, I'm glad I had. I'm glad it. I mean, first of all, the fact that it such a small world came full circle. The rest, everything we've been talking about today, rescue me and this movie, uh, and the, the backstory of both of those. I mean, both of these projects have this amazing and tragic uh, uh, backstories that are real. You know that 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 helped spawn these things that i didn't even realize uh we we're uh, i didn't know and didn't realize that we were going to get to talk about that here today so i thank you for that because that's that's so that's something that i think everyone at home uh appreciates when you when you know where that inspiration truly is coming from on a project like rescue me or the retaliators man i would love let's let's talk and maybe we could get her on the phone for the follow-up uh if if possible because that would be fantastic because i mean i yeah, that's an incredible story. And if she's open and open about it, and then the fact that you know she's has this, you know, kind of uh, happy ending to it, uh, making it chief. Uh, my neighbor across the street ha- ha- is a is a battalion chief in uh, in Southern California, actually fire fireman. Oh, um, cool. So I mean, that's it's yeah, it's all it's all full circle, all comes together. Small world, man. It's 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 wild. That's that's cool. so. 
That's so, that's truly, truly remarkable to me. It is. It's so serendipitous. The thing is too, she, I would love to, for her to come on and talk with you. She's amazing. And, uh, she's very outspoken because she said to her brothers, look, if this movie ever does anything, maybe my story can help someone, you know, maybe. And then she came to the, we, 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 we got into uh, Scream Fest, one of, you know, arguably one of the top genre festivals in the world. We got into Freight Fest in the UK. That was our world premiere. And that's when I was telling you I wanted to make a real mo- movie first. That was my first, like, oh my God, someone else has seen the movie and they like it, you know? And we got into, so we got into Scr- uh, Freight Fest. Then we got into Scream Fest. And we played at the Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood. And she came and they told the story. She t- we, the, the writers told the story and with me. And then I got to meet her for the first time and give her a big hug. And it was, wonderful but the thing that was crazy is other people came up to her and thanked them for sharing for her sharing her story and one of them was like a a a, a male guy who was raped and he related to what she was going through and i thought how wonderful this story can be spread and that was her wish like if there's and again, like what's crazy is the retaliators is not about someone being brutally attacked and raped or brutally attacked yeah. but it's about this concept you know, like the revenge, like you said, the, revenge, the, you know, yeah. would you take it? And half the people should be like, hell yeah. And then maybe the other half are on the fence, but it's sort of easy to watch from your seat. But if you're really put in front of another human being, could you do it? You know, and those are the kind of concepts that it's. That's, yeah. And I think that's the, 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 what you just touched upon, I think is the only one uh, that, that is the question mark. I think, I think everyone wants to think that they would obviously act upon that revenge but you know same it's it's that it's something that i feel like nature is uh, forces you to be born with it or 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 without it that fight or flight like would you actually go through with the maybe the torment or the actual murder of somebody else even out of something that you know is like so right in a lot of ways you know like could you still do it because it is taking another life you know like it's that's the big question mark behind it all right absolutely man 100 yeah percent man okay well let's i want to tie a bow on this but there was a a couple things before let's lighten the mood back up a little bit uh and and get back into (laughs) amazing amazing insight to the movie everyone go check out uh, uh retaliators it's uh, we we described a lot of it here, I, I I think Michael, but obviously there's some there's some surprises to be seen um, uh, in in the movie. So um, go check that out. But uh, lastly, or the the second to last thing I want to bring up, we mentioned being in Prague, and uh, and we talked a little bit about having beers and stuff, and then and uh, with with crew members and stuff, and wanted to ask you about. Uh, Prague specifically, where you're out there for four months. I've enjoyed the Czech Republic. Uh, uh, immensely especially for their um uh, uh absinthe absinthe bars there were you able to visit any of the absinthe bars there and uh and what was your impression of prague like i mean as i said we get to tour but we're we're in and out of these cities a couple days three days four days max yeah we're there for four months in prague um and i and i've been several times so i know a little bit about it but like I, I love the drinking atmosphere there. Basically, Prague has great food and great drinking and stuff. So, can you talk uh, to me about any any of that you got to experience while on the set for the last night? Yeah, beautiful people, fun. The the bars, uh, the you know what what's cool. If this gives you any uh, sort of chew into who this guy is, Clive Owen. See, we filmed the whole time too, man. There was a lot. Like it's hard to get away, but you know you have your time. You get to go you know, for dinners and escape sometimes, uh, not a lot in the whole four months, but I can only imagine, uh, music videos are, are all day sets. And I mean, you, yeah. you're doing that for four months straight. That's yeah. You know, you're trying you to you get your time. I'm my character might not be in the scene for that, you know, a couple of days. So I get to come around and then, but, uh, uh, the whole city is like a film set to me. It's so gorgeous. And then we were there through Christmas and like, they have this thing, mm-hmm where they scare their kids into being good for Christmas. <laughs> they're, they're anti Santa Clauses. They're these huge creatures that walk around with like big antlers and, and they're like maybe dies on stilts. So they, so they, they, you know, in the, in the city, which is beautiful. They have, 
a lot of booths set up to buy Christmas. I could, oh, I wish I was there. I missed it so much. It was, a, it was a while ago. I wouldn't a lucky experience, but yeah. So they have that. That was really cool. And they're made with big furry cot. Like they put some effort in and it's beautiful. And like, if you're not good for Santa, that's what you're getting the monsters. So that so was, rad. yeah. So rad. And then Clive Owen, to give you an idea of who that guy is, when you're at the bar with him, he's sitting with the stuntmen. You know what I mean? That guy's like a guy's guy, actor's actor. Like, talk about being with the crew, not hiding in his trailer, like right there to shoot. We shot nights there. So they were like, you know, because it had to be dark and it was all lit by fire, which was really cool. But you have like three, four layers of long johns underneath your like wardrobe and you're sitting in this heating tent and you go out and you shoot and he's right there man with you the whole time and we had a lot of fun pops together and a lot of good stories um so i think the bars the experience the the you know and then you get like a cool flat like a, a an apartment there for the four months it's so fun you know doing what you're doing but but again it's really those are all i i it's about the work, man. And then all these great things we do get to happen, right? Uh, right. Uh, all these great things come with it if you're lucky. Um, so right. yeah, I loved it, man. Like you very much. It is so cool. So cool. Love that spot. And uh, love hearing that about Clive Owens. Like it kind of personifies, was it, was it the Max Fury? What was, what was his, uh, Max Payne? What was the other movie he was in? Uh, Max oh, something. Wait. So, well, one of my favorite movies is in his Children of Men. Have you seen that That's, movie? Yeah, yeah, I have not, actually. Children oh, of Men. Dude, you got to see that one. You'll like I'll check it. check that one out. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, but he is like, you know, you don't see that guy popping up on the cover of, like, OK Magazine or whatever. You know, he's been around. He picks his projects. He's really smart of what he wants to do. And he, he depicts... This is what Sin I my City. observation. Sin City was in, right? Sin in City, bro. Yes. Uh, we talked about that earlier. Here we come full circle again. Yeah. He, but he picks his projects and he puts a lot of thought into what he wants to do. And, you know, he's a hell of an actor and a hell of a guy. Yeah, man. I can only imagine. So the last thing, sorry, I uh, don't want to cut that off. I know there's so much more we could get into there. You just... You know, all the, all the brilliant people you've worked with, you're brilliant yourself and, you know, talking how you. you've learned from Dennis Leary so much. I mean, I, 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 could, I could talk to you for hours about all that stuff alone. And then, of course, the Retaliators movie. We'll have more to talk about via text and hopefully a follow-up phone call later on. But uh, no I did see that there's a new, uh, there's a project coming called Plan B with John Heater and uh, Shannon, Eliz uh, Shannon Elizabeth yeah. uh, to... Shannon Elizabeth fell in love with her like most of us in American Pie, and yeah. uh, and, and it all came from that. It all stemmed from that, and then of course she does the Jay and Silent Bob strike back as uh, Boo Boo Kitty fuck, um, yeah. <laughs> and John Heater of course from uh, what was uh, Napoleon and Dynamite, Napoleon and Dynamite, and yeah. Blaze of Glory with uh, Will Ferrell, obviously. Yeah. And so, so it, it, there's not a lot out about this movie yet. So I just wanted to know if there's anything you could tell me about it. I know that it's a comedy, so I'm excited about that. I'm excited to see you in the in in a in a comedic role now after after seeing you in this very serious retaliators role and even uh you know it was border as we talked about drama comedy on on Rescue Me. So what well, can you tell yeah. me a little bit about Plan B? Yeah, man. Thanks. That's funny you knew about it. I shot that maybe uh, like eight weeks ago. What was so cool was being able to do some comedy and just act like an idiot because there was so much improv. It was like, uh, you know, just so fun to get crazy. And uh, uh, Jamie Lynn from um, uh, uh, Ted Lasso, she's a writer on Ted Lasso and an actress is in it. And you know, okay, yeah, yeah. sick part. So it's like a romantic comedy. It's really fun. Um, just, to, just it was so John heaters of what a sweet man and what a great dude. Um, and he's so talented. And one of the houses we were filming at, it was funny because he was standing right there and then they in the bathroom they had like a, a poster and it was all of sort of like these legendary film characters and napoleon dynamite was one of them so there's heater oh, and that's I'm like, funny yeah it was cool uh, you know like maybe they had the karate kid like ralph macchio john heater yeah, like yeah, yeah. just a ton of them though like beyond that too like whether it was uh rambo or just all these different and uh but you know it was sick man um no matter when we'd wrap, if it were two in the afternoon or four in the morning, I'd go to the hotel bar and there would be my boy, Tom Berenger, 
with a nice cold yeah. room in front of him. And he played my dad in the movie. And I'd sit down. I always looked for him. When I say my boy, it's not like he was my boy, but I just love talking to him. And he's done 89, over 89 feature films, Platoon, Academy Award nominee, oh, yeah. talks to me about Oliver Stone, John Melios, just all these great stories. And I'd sit down with him and we'd have about two beers and then, you know, he'd go up and uh, he was just awesome, dude. Tom Berenger, he's he's older now. He played, like I said, he plays my father in the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was really cool, man. Got to hang with that's him. Cool. That, that's cool. That's that's one of those moments too, where it's someone that you grew up watching on a lot of those films and stuff and then here you are on set with them you know uh that that's that's one of those cool again full circle moments man and uh, i want to thank you again so much for your time there was some other stuff i wanted to ask you about retaliators we'll get that in we'll get into that because there's a couple other actors in that movie that I, that I had a couple questions about that i'd seen some previous stuff so we'll cool. get into that on the follow-up and just in general i think uh this is a start of a good of a good friendship so uh let's keep in touch my friend Absolutely, Johnny. Thank you so much for having me, man. What a fun time with you. And thank you for your thoughtfulness and your questions and your time. No, oh, the pleasure's all mine, man. Everyone go check out the Retaliators and we'll uh, see y'all next time. Cheers.